Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, I'm here today at DSA taking a look at some of the very cool guns in their reference collection to film for you guys. Now today we have the Spanish Amelie, which is a very rare and very hyped light machine gun, a squad automatic weapon actually. This is in 5.56, it's belt fed. It was adopted by the Spanish Army as the MG82 uh, MG in 1982. Its development actually began back in 1974, so it just slightly predates the Setme L series of rifles, but as you can see from the polymer and the paint color, this is a gun that was adopted in concert essentially with the Setme L as a modernization program by the Spanish Army in the early 1980s when they went to transition from 7.62 NATO to 5.56 NATO. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, oh, it's a scaled down 5.56 MG42. And while it takes a lot of design cues from the MG42, and there's a lot of similarities here, it does have one really substantial mechanical difference from the 42, and that is this is not a locked action, this is a roller delayed blowback. The MG42 also uses rollers, but it is a recoil operated roller locked system. That seems like a pretty pedantic difference, but it actually has some technical implications on roller delayed blowback guns like this and like the entire HK family, like the G3, like the Setme L rifles that the Spanish also adopted, it means that the barrel is fixed in place. This has potential implications for accuracy um, as well as the, complex the required complexity of construction. So for instance, the MG42 requires a barrel booster because the barrel has to reciprocate back each time that it fires. The Amelie, like the Setme L, does not have a barrel booster because the barrel is fixed in place. Now beyond that, yeah, a lot of similarities uh, to the MG42. And of course this is uh, belt fed, it's 5.56, and um, well development began in 1974, it was first introduced in 1981, formally adopted in 1982, and there are a lot of people who say, and look at it on paper, and I'd be included in them, saying this seems like an absolutely magnificent 5.56 squad automatic weapon. It weighs in, by the way, at 6.4 kilos. That's 13 and a half pounds. That's like, this This is a gun that is a legitimate competitor with the Ultimax for light, handy, and very effective 5.56 saw. So today, I wanna to take this whole thing apart down to its component pieces, because the more you take it apart, the cooler and cleverer this design gets. So let's dig into it. The first thing I'm going to do here is show you this belt box, and then we're going to take it off the gun so it's a little easier to film here. Um, they made 100 and 200 round belt boxes for these guns. This is 100 rounds, and it has a clear polymer uh, front, well, back, so the gunner can see exactly how much ammunition is remaining in there. We have a little latch right here that allows me to slide this off. We've got a couple plastic tabs right there that lock into these grooves on the uh, holder. Apparently they did also make a 50 round drum, metal drum, like the MG42 and MG34 had, uh, but they don't appear to have really gone into service. I haven't actually, I've seen pictures, but I haven't seen a real one. Um, anyway, you load your belt in here. It's not intended to be reusable, um, so just toss it when you're done with it. And as you can see, when it sits on the gun, the belt's going to come out this side, loop up around this curved surface, and feed into the gun that way. The other cool element here is that we have a disposable simple plastic starter tab uh, just attached in with the drum. So shows you which orientation, there's your starter tab, like everything's self-contained here and when you're done you just chuck it. Now a quick look at the markings, Amelie, so Amatraya Ligera, light machine gun 556 made in Spain. Uh, these were all manufactured by Santa Barbara, government owned Small arms. They did manufactured things beyond small arms, but um, the gun was designed by Setme, so the same Setme that designed the Setme L. That is Centro de Estudios Técnicos uh, Mecánicos de. I can't remember exactly what it is. I'll write it at the bottom of the video. And then on this side we have our serial number. There was an A pattern, uh, early production, and a B pattern that was sort of more standard production. This is B. Um, this is our importer, because this is in the US, so that would not normally be on there. But uh, the biggest way you can tell the B type guns is by the muzzle. So we have a combination flash hider and muzzle brake here, but it is cylindrical. The A pattern guns had a very, uh, like a 45 degree sharp conical flash hider at the muzzle. So easy to distinguish them. This is the more typical military pattern. 
I'm going to take the sling off next, also to get it out of the way. Kind of cool the way it hooks onto the top of the buttstock here, very much intended for sort of an assault style position. I can pivot that up, slide that out, and then it just has an HK style hook on a pivoting sling hook right there. The controls are very simple. We have a charging handle here on the side. It is non-reciprocating and the original NA versions of the gun actually had an, F, an MG42 style um, sort of a T-handle leveraging charging handle. They got rid of that for the B pattern because you really don't need it. It's not that strong of a spring, uh, really not that big of a deal. So charging handle there. There is a selector switch on the back of the pistol grip. This is the fire position. Snap it through, which you can only do when the gun is cocked. That's the safe position. That's it. There is no semi-auto mode on this. It's off and high. The front sight folds down for transport, and then we can lift it up here to actually use. You can see you have a, a rather narrow uh, pin front post. The rear sight is uh, very HK or set me like, not surprisingly. Um, we have a notch sight here with the 10 position, and then we have a series of three aperture sights for 800, 600, and 300 meters. And you can see it displays the current range there on the side. That's your sight aperture in the center. The bipod is very much MG42 inspired. Um, it locks into the bottom of the barrel shroud here just through tension. So all I have to do is pull it down. You can snap it in place, just pull it down, and it's going to spring open. This is a little awkward to get on camera, but very much like an MG42 bipod. Once you have this set up, you have quite a bit of rotation that you can get in the bipod. And then you can, in fact, push into it because it will only come this far back. It'll collapse forward, so if you need the gun to be lower, you can do that. But if you want to push into it to get pressure for good stable shooting, you can do that. And then removing the bipod is really quite easy. We just have these two spring latches on the side, pull them in, and off it comes. And those are just a pair of spring catches here that snap into these two lugs on the bottom of the barrel shroud. Now for barrel changing or barrel removal, we have an open gate in the side here, but we'll leave that closed for the moment. The carry handle here is mostly integral to the barrel itself. This is mounted onto the receiver, but this handle is the barrel changing handle. Um, unlike the MG42, where you have to have the bolt retracted in order to remove the barrel, the Amelie, because it's a, a delayed system instead of a locked system, the, there are no locking lugs that lock the bolt into the barrel, so I don't actually have to have the bolt back. The bolt can be forward and I can change the barrel just the same. So first I'm just going to take this spring catch, pull it back, and push that barrel handle off to the side. As I pull this the rest of the way down, it's going to pop open that trap door on its own, and then I push the barrel forward, pull it out, and slide it out the back of the receiver. So we've got these two lugs that lock the barrel into the trunnion. There's the handle assembly. And then up front we have this round bearing surface. We have nine compensator holes here, and this is oriented vertical. So these are actually oriented to push the gun uh, down and to the left. So designed for a right-handed shooter, the gun's going to climb to the right. They put these compensator holes in specifically to counteract that, as well as, of course, flash hider slots. Next step, we're going to push out this one cross pin. That just locks the, uh, the feed box assembly in place. So with that out, I can pull this guy off. That just basically acts as an ejection port guide and a mounting position for a belt box. If you want the pin to be captive, you can not. It is worth noting at this point that people talk about parts compatibility between the Amelie and the Setme Ls. This is the parts compatibility. The two cross pins are the only parts that will interchange between those two platforms. Other than that, no similarities. Next, I'm going to take off the feed cover. I should have actually showed you this earlier probably, but you've got two spring-loaded catches back here. 
that lets me lift up the feed, uh, feed cover. We have a feed tray underneath as well, very much an MG42 system. The roller cam on the bolt is spring-loaded so that you can close this cover whether the bolt is forward or back, doesn't matter. Um, there is nothing, there is no spring that holds this cover up. You can rest it slightly forward, you can see it sits slightly forward or vertical on the rear sight block, but otherwise it will just fall shut. So to take this off, we have one more cross pin here. On the MG42 there's some clever stuff where you can only take this pin out when the top cover's at the right angle. For the Setme, for the Amelie, it's just another standard cross pin. Pull that out, and I can lift off the top cover and the feed tray. One of the interesting features here, one of the weak points, I think, of this design is right here. That is the ejector. It is pinned in place right there. So it is a, a replaceable removable part, which is a good idea, but it's this little kind of flimsy thing that's pinned into the top cover. So there's a, a further disassembly trick that I'll show you when we get a little farther that makes, that compounds this, but that's fragile. I can see that being a problem. Next up I want to take the buttstock off. Uh, I need to have the bolt forward for this, so we'll put that forward. There is a little catch right there, and all I have to do to take the buttstock off is push that down. This is intended to be done with a cartridge. I have a little pin punch here that I'll use. So I just push that down, and then there we go. The buttstock comes off the back of the gun. Same sort of green polymer that we have on the Setme Ls. Note that we have a tripod mounting, a pair of tripod mounting lugs back here, if you want to set this up as an emplaced gun. This latch at the rear does double duty, locking the buttstock on and locking the buffer system in place. So to take the buffer out, I push this down and then I can rotate the buffer 90 degrees. And then the buffer, the spring, and the bolt assembly all come out. They are going to come to this point where I have to press the roller bearing down through that hole. There we go. And then I can pull that out. And there is our whole internal assembly. So we have a captive spring and buffer system, which is really cool. So here's our slot for the ejector right there. You can see the rollers at the front. When the bolt goes back, those rollers are pushed out into recesses in the trunnion so that when it fires, uh, pressure is going to push inward on these, which has to force back the whole mass of the rear section here before the bolt can start moving. So that's, that's the, uh, the delaying action right there. We can take this, rotate it 90 degrees, pull it off, and then we also have our firing pin here. One of the little problems, again, that I see in this gun is you have this slot cut in the firing pin extension, and that is for the ejector right here. That ejector has to ride in that slot like this. However, you can assemble this piece upside down, Whoop. just like that, and the whole gun will go back together. The gun goes back together just fine, and it appears to work, but what will happen is when you close, when you try to drop the bolt, it will jam on this ejector because you don't have a slot deep enough right there for the ejector to run in. Um, and that is, that is actually a problem that I encountered the first time I took this apart. So you have to have this right side up. What they should have done is just cut that groove on both sides so it didn't matter. Simple next step, we can take the charging handle out. It's just going to slide to the rear here and then I can pull it out. The grip assembly comes off, I just have to take out this pin, just tap that out gently, and then the grip assembly is going to slide backward, there we go, and lift out. Very MG42-ish, we just have a dropping sear there, not much going on. Now this is where disassembly would normally end, because now I've just got the receiver, but we can take this another couple of steps and actually take the barrel shroud off the receiver, which is really cool. So what's going on here is I have a receiver in the back, I have a trunnion in the middle, you can see it through there. We have the barrel shroud at the front, we actually have two steel plates, they're the green ones here, that clamp 
the, those three parts together, and then these two black pieces clamp over the outside to hold it all in place. So I can take these two hex head screws, socket head screws out. Like so, and then this comes off and then there is our clamping plate. Now we've also got this screw which I have just tapped out so that I can remove the rear sight tower there which sits in this like that and then I can pull this piece off and this clamping plate off and now I can pull the barrel shroud off the front and the trunnion itself out of the gun. So there's the trunnion. It's not screwed in. It's not welded in. It's actually clamped into the gun. So here's our actual receiver. The guide rails are built into it. I think they're actually welded into it. You've got tracks for the bolt to run in there. The front here is just a lightweight shroud that covers the barrel, uh, protects your hand, gives a mounting point for the front sight. And then this trunnion is where the bolt head is going to lock in on one side, and the barrel locks in on the other. Now this sort of system is really cool, but it does potentially have some downsides. You've got a lot of fitting in here, a lot of clamping, and apparently the Spanish Marines in particular started having trouble with these guns in the field where essentially this whole thing would loosen up a bit. And if the barrel shroud and the trunnion uh, were able to move a bit in the receiver, it caused real problems with accuracy because the barrel was moving around sort of independently of the sights. And so what the Spanish Marines did on at least some of their amelies was actually weld these pieces together. So you'll see some of them occasionally with welded on uh, receiver plates there, and that's why they did that. So there you have a uh, slightly more than field stripped set me Amelie. It's been a long time that I've been wanting to be able to put this one together for you guys, so this is really cool to be able to do. All told, as best I can tell, there were only three to four thousand Amelies that were actually manufactured by Santa Barbara. Um, production began in 1981, production ended in 2003. The guns were adopted by the Spanish military as well as the Mexican and Malaysian militaries, and a few of these have kind of gotten out and about, especially in Central and South America. They'll, you'll see them showing up um, in various military forces down there, um, despite not being formally adopted. So the, the gun really just was never quite at the right place at the right time for large-scale adoption, and on top of that, it has a relatively poor reputation for field in field service because allegedly what happened is the, the early production guns, the trials guns, the procurement guns were all made to a very high standard of materials and workmanship, much like the Setme L rifles. And then when Santa Barbara got into mass production, they kind of let the quality control slip. And a lot of Spanish soldiers complain about these guns not being particularly reliable and having issues with fragile parts and easy breakage. So how much of that is the gun is simply in order to make it as light as it is, you have to cut some corners on material strength and you can't just take these guns and use them as crowbars and ladders and tire irons, which happens in military forces. Things have to be overbuilt. But if you want the gun nice and light, you have to build it to kind of a more normal, real, you know, like a more sane level of uh, durability. And when you do that, soldiers will figure out ways to break them. So how much was that? How much was actual Santa Barbara quality control? I'm sure there are elements of both. It's hard to, to put an exact measurement on, on where exactly the problems came from here. Now, in 2008, the Spanish military replaced this in service uh, with the H&K MG4. So they absolutely, they went back to a heavier gun, uh, but a more durable one. So that leaves the Amelie as sort of this odd orphan, similar to the Ultimax, where a uh, very good gun, very good design, lots of clever elements, but just not very widely adopted. A big thanks to DSA for giving me access to this one to take apart and show to you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.